Good evening, everybody. Uh, in case you hadn't noticed, that was the Heavy Chef song. Um, and thank you, by the way, to Divine Mahara, the very, very talented uh, Zimbabwean singer-songwriter who is watching, uh, I believe, right now, Ola Divine. Uh, he actually is busy writing a whole, uh, uh, whole lot of new songs for us as well for our learning platform. So I'm really excited for that. And in future events, which I'll talk a little bit about in, in due course, uh, Divine's actually going to come and play on stage uh, to to get amongst it and and uh, I think kickstart the, the the live thing again, which I'm really excited. I'm really excited to be here tonight, out and about. It feels so weird having real people in real life in a real live setting with a real live mountain uh, at the back there, and uh, and just some real live faces, some familiar people. And, uh, and some, some newcomers, so welcome to everybody, welcome everybody who, um, who are joining us uh, in the live stream tonight, it's so good to have everyone here. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction uh, and just kind of give you a little bit of a, an idea of what, what this is all about and, uh, and why we are here. I think just for those of you who don't know, Heavy Chef uh, is a learning platform for entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got nothing to do with cooking. We are not a cooking show, just for those of you who are confused. And there are um, some wonderful uh, banting bread mixes, the big uh, banting mix uh, from Sally and Creed at the back there. I do encourage everybody to take one home and try it. It's also known, I think it's in the, in the little label there, as Fred's favorite. Um, so... so <laughs> Creed Living is actually a partner of Heavy Chef, so anyone who's a member of Heavy Chef uh, gets 10% off of all Creed Living uh, goods on their website, and that is the best item on the menu. Let me tell you, I have it every week, and I absolutely love it. So do, do take it home and, and enjoy it. Other than that, there's not a lot of cooking stuff going on here. We're all about, uh, we're all about recipes for entrepreneurs. And uh, our core belief at Heavy Chef is that entrepreneurs can change the world for the better. And so if you think about the change that's needed in the world today, and there's a lot of uh, systemic and, and uh, endemic problems uh, that, are, that we're faced, challenges that we're faced with, uh, you know, it's our belief at Heavy Chef that, that entrepreneurs provides at least one of the most efficient ways of overcoming those, um, those challenges. And so at Heavy Chef, our, our aim is to inspire people to start things and then empower them to succeed. And we do that by uh, serving up recipes for entrepreneurs in bite-sized chunks. So we believe in the, the sort of, I suppose, bite-sized learning revolution, that learning is changing irrevocably. So we've created a platform, an online platform at heavychef.com. I do encourage all of you to go and check it out, sign up, it's free to sign up, uh, thereafter there's a monthly fee, which is what we call a, uh, an all-you-can-eat pass, which gives you access to everything on the Heavy Chef platform, all the partner benefits, all the, the bites, and we are increasing the learning every week, uh, we're adding new recipes to to the platform, which essentially includes all the sort of Swiss Army knife uh, um, uh, tools of entrepreneurship, everything that you need to to know about entrepreneurship that is essentially taught by other entrepreneurs, technologists, leaders, and uh, and creatives. So tonight is something fresh uh, that we're serving up. It's the first of our new event season using new technology uh, with our new event partners, Howler. I'm really excited to have them on board. Uh, Hala uh, Shai Evian actually is, is uh, an old friend of mine from, <laughs> from way back when I saw him on stage at a pitching contest and he just blew me away with his enthusiasm and Hala is just such a great brand and they've done such great things despite the challenges of, uh, of the pandemic and lockdown. I think they've just created an amazing, uh, a, an amazing solution for, for hybrid events which we're trying out today. So. I encourage you guys to go check out Hala. Um, and with that in mind, the event season that we're, we're looking at is really exciting. Over the next 
12 months, uh, we've just got some of the world's best speakers lined up for this stage. And we, we really want to grow this community. We really want to grow these events and really provide as many people with access to incredible minds like Cora and Carl that we have tonight. Um, uh, tonight's topic is raising capital. Uh, so I do encourage you guys to prepare your questions. We've got a bunch of people from the online audience who've submitted their questions already. So thank you to everyone on, online. We are going to try and get through as many of those questions as possible. I have diluted some of them and merged some of them and gone through them this afternoon. And, uh, and there are quite a few coming through social as well. So in upcoming months, just to give you a little bit of a, a taste test, a preview of what's going on, I'm going to really flog the, uh, the cooking analogies tonight. Um, in October, we've got an e-commerce event uh, with Arthur Goldstuck and Tepo Mokhlala uh, of Tepo Jeans. Um, November, we've got storytelling with Lauren Bukas and uh, Mokhale Mashikho, the two authors. Uh, Lauren Bukas, you'll probably recognize from The Shining Girls, which was picked up um, as a major series on, online, one of South Africa's greatest storytellers. December, we've got South Africa's top five most exciting startups, uh, which you'll see on our um, socials and, and in our communications in, in the next few days. January, we've got Future Trends with Bronwyn Williams and Dion Chang. February, we've got Investing uh, in Women. And uh, is Wusi here tonight? No, she, has she arrived yet? No, we've got one of the speakers uh, who is coming tonight. I'm really excited about that one. Um, and then March, we've got the Yappy Chef story with Andrea and Shane, the two co-founders of Yappy Chef. Uh, April, we've got Teams, Culture and Technology. May, we've got Public Speaking and, and, and. We've got so, just so many great speakers lined up. We are super excited. So I do encourage everybody just to, uh, to, to follow us on Twitter, follow us on, on Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And, uh, and we'll see you at upcoming events. So... Before I get stuck into the questions for tonight um, and uh, introduce our two illustrious speakers, I just want to say a big thanks to our, our, our partners who, without whom we would not be here and we wouldn't have the support that we have and the momentum that we have uh, and, uh, and who have supported us through this whole journey of, of trying to create this ecosystem for entrepreneurs. Um, primarily, of the f first up, right from the start, we've had support from Zero and Payfast. Thanks to the teams, we've we've just gone such a, a long road together, and um, and just seeing how Zero and Payfast have grown in the space has been incredible. Retail Capital, uh, who uh, Carl started in 2011. Okay, so 10 years ago, and it's just become the the biggest and best of the alternative lending options out there and just such an incredibly innovative company. Just really, really stoked to have retail capital on board as well as Ex Nilo, Digital Capital, uh, di uh, sorry, Digital Planets, WeGrow SA, HP Store, Workshop 17, uh, also who've supported us right from the start in this beautiful venue as well as across the country. I encourage everybody to check them out online. Uh, Baxberg, so Fruit, Good Leaf, the CBD water here, it won't get you high, but it'll mellow you out, maybe. Um, Parcel Ninja and uh, Creed Living, we've spoken about, and then Hala. So, with that in mind, we're going to crack on with the, uh, the, the, the questions. And um, first of all, I just want to welcome uh, our speakers on board. I'm really, really stoked to consider both of you my friends. And, uh, and just watching how both of you have grown in the space and, uh, and, and making an impact on this, this community. It's just been such an honor. And thank you for giving up your time tonight and providing your, uh, your knowledge and your experience. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go gentle with the questions. I'm just going to give you that. <laughs> there are going to be some crackers here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage all of you to, to engage with our speakers. We really do have just an amazing opportunity tonight to ask, ask um, Cora and Carl, uh, you know, whatever you need, whatever's on your mind, whatever's challenging you. But I, I just want to, I want to uh, just kick off um, a, a question for you, Cora. And, and you've already spoken on our stage about w what does it mean to be investable? What does an investable uh, company look like? And I, I want to just ask with a fairly basic uh, start off with a fairly basic question 
when looking at prospective investments, w what do you look for? What, what intrigues you and, and what kind of blows your hair back? Is this thing on? Is this one on? Hashtag. Hashtag. <laughs> Heavy ship. Hello, hello. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Is it on? It is on. No, it's, it's on. not. <laughs> Me too, fully. I have a very loud fully. voice anyway, so. Fully. Uh, is, uh, Fred, thank you very much. Um, for inviting me again uh, to this event. I, I thoroughly enjoy it and I thoroughly enjoy the questions because it gives me an opportunity to understand what people are worrying about, specific in relation to the investment and financing community and becoming investable. I think it's an important question and we from the sector underestimate the huge say, inv information gap that sits between the entrepreneur and us in the financing thing community. So thank you for the opportunity for us to, to do this. And, uh, I'm actually got a suspicious thing when I looked at the other people that you invited in the past. The only reason why you invite me is so that you can keep the, the heavy on the label of the camp because I'm the only <laughs> heavy one here. Look at Kali, looks like he's training for the Iron Man. And the last time you put me here with other people that were like uh, cycling 100 uh, uh, kilometers a week. So I think now I know I'm here. If I lose 20 k, you're not going to have that anymore. Cora, I think you look great. Just for the record, <laughs> I think you look amazing. Um, so what, what do I look for? What uh, uh, makes, a, for me, what excites me about an investment idea? Uh, first of all, it's the, it's the jockey or the cheerleader, uh, you know, how they speak about the idea and how passionate they are and, uh, and how they demonstrate their understanding of the sector that they're playing in. So, you know, most of the, and that's one, probably one of the... Put it close to your... Mouth. There we go. There okay, we go. Cool. There we go. Uh, is it this one is doesn't have social distance. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> yours. It's yours. <laughs> is it mine? We're gonna burn it afterwards. Okay. Feels like I must put the mask on. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so, so the, for me, the uh, most important part in investment opportunity and how you assess it, whether it's being assessed for an equity investment or whether it's being sent for a debt investment, and the two are very different, but still, uh, for me, it's very important to see that. The entrepreneur understands the sector that they operate in, they understand who are their competitors, and they understand what are the dynamics happening in the industry. Because if you don't, uh, uh, you know, people are going to take you out in like a week. Uh, because if you don't understand the sector, you don't know who you're up against, you haven't done your research. So for me, that is probably by far the most important thing because <coughs> the, the second part linked to understanding the sector is how the entrepreneur and the cheerleaders have translated the idea into numbers, you know, because many people can talk about the idea and you get excited, but then if you don't know who's sitting in a garage somewhere in Salt River that's going to take you out of business, then this, this discussion is exercise of utility, especially if that person is uh, uh, generating a similar idea or going to disintermediate you um, out of his garage in Salt River and he has Carl as a sponsor, then we're dead in the water, you understand? So you need to understand what's happening in the sector you know, who's coming for your lunch. Um, and of course, the numbers are obviously very important. Cash flow is king. Uh, you know, profit stuff is nice, but the ca when is the cash coming? It's, for me, that's, a, that's the most important part. Okay, so, you're sorry, I don't know. I think the levels. <laughs> I, hello, hello, yeah. hello. So, um, uh, okay then, Mr. Ironman, I'm gonna ask you then the question, just to set the scene, because I love that answer, and I, I, I totally agree, the people, and just through the lens that we have, the community at, at Heavy Chef, we see how important people are to the teams, and how, how the, you know, a team gels. Um, you know, but then, once you've got the concept, you've got the team, you've got the, the cash flow, and you, you, you have this view of what it is, or, you know, can, can we talk about, I want to start getting into the weeds around what what are the options available? And let's start, and just by setting the scene, particularly given retail capital, what is alternative lending? What does it refer to? Because it seems to now have come to the fore. So alternative, can you hear me? Okay. So alternative lending is, is pretty much any lending that happens outside the formal banking system. Okay, so you get your formal banks and they've got their products that they follow. 
and they follow their own governance processes. But once you sit outside the banking system, and many of the cases not regulated, it's, it's considered alternative lending. And it's probably one of the fastest growing sectors. So I think in the US now it's $60 billion a year, uh, UK is $10 billion a year. So these things are, are gaining momentum. And it, it tends to be much more digital, uh, paperless, um, much quicker turnaround times, uh, less dependent on assets and structures and those types of things. So it's, it's a much quicker, easier way of accessing finance outside the banking system. Can we just, just add a tiny little extra bit on that? Like what, what do the process look like? Let's just say you, you now approach uh, retail capital, like how? What is it, how, does, what is that, how does that work? So just tell you what Cora says. So in the past, you tended to look very much at the jockey. So if I'm doing an equity investment, I look at the jockey, absolutely. Understand who they are, track record, those types of things. In the debt space, you then used to look at asset security. That's typically a banking type environment. And as you start shifting to the, into the alternative lending space, we're shifting actually more into data. And we're not, in many cases, not looking at the jockey. In many cases, looking at current cash flows going through the business and making an assessment before they even apply. So <laughs> 10 years ago when we started the business, you'd have to fill in forms, you'd have to send bank statements and merchant statements, and then we'd take five days to assess it and send an answer. We now, with partnerships, the likes of the, the MPOS point of sale providers, we can now take that data, pre-score customers, put an offer on their portal, so their app or their web portal, and all they have to do is accept it. There's no application required, there's no documents to be signed, and that's a 30 second process. So, I mean, you put yourself in the shoes of a, can even an informal trader. If you've got a, and one of your partners is Yoko, if you have a Yoko device, and you're transacting through the device, you can wake up at four o'clock in the morning on a Thursday morning and go, I need stock for the weekend on Friday, I need 5,000 Rand, you can draw it down and have it in your account the next day. So what's wonderful about this is that we have, with the two of you, this beautiful continuum of, you know, Cora, you coming at it from, I would say, this very kind of people-centric and, um, and multivariant focus where you, you're taking a whole lot of factors within a business, you know, an equity investment that probably is a little bit more mature Whereas, Carl, you're looking at this, uh, it, it's going into the fintech realm of, you know, ones and zeros and, and really kind of taking the algorithm into, into the mix, which, which seems a lot more efficient, I suppose, and, and immediate. What, what kind of numbers, are, what's the sort of range of finance that you would be able to raise? I mean, I'm not going to ask you this question because that's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars, but, but with... With retail capital, for example, where does that, that, that range lie? So in our traditional, what we call a high-touch model, where it's a face-to-face -face and more information is available, we're doing deals up to sort of 7 million rand per, per business. In the low-touch space, where it's all pre-qualified, no documentation, we're doing sort of up to 350, 400,000 rand. But we can do, the beauty of that model is it's a frictionless model. So we can do as low as 2,000 rand, and it'll still be profitable for us. Whereas in the high touch model, as soon as you start involving agents face to face and underwriters and overheads, and you, you can't you can't do much less than a fifty thousand rand type deal. That's not profitable. Okay, so I, I want to now segue into more of a broad strokes question, and particularly given the last eighteen months of just freaking mayhem everywhere. So, if we can then, uh, and this is a question actually for both of you, but Cora, starting with you. How do you feel about the temperature? Where, like, how, are you feeling positive? Are you feeling, you know, glass half full, glass really leaking out? I mean, <laughs> where, where do you feel in terms of your lens on the investment space? I think you must ask Nikki there of Spoon Money how she feels. Um, <laughs> um, now, uh, Fred, look, I, I, think, uh, um, I think for me it feels like we're through the worst, uh, not because things are done, but because we have much greater visibility, we've been stress tested, if I can put it that way. Our, our, abil our agility or lack thereof is put through his paces. So I think we kind of, you know, March last year, in February last year taught us that 
we can we can actually stuff that we can do you know hindsight so uh, i'm not fi i'm not i'm a natural optimist you know i always look for the silver lining uh, i have i'm from the school of thought of never waste a crisis um and i think in my m my belief is humanity will always uh, thrive and and i i enjoy crises I'm, I'm fortunate that i've been through a couple not to through this extent you know going back to 2000 the car will remember how that felt um uh, and so you 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 see the benefits after the effect of how each time you, you have a, a crisis, be it economic, systemic, or financial, or sector, like the tech one, um, you know, we come out wiser, stronger, different, faster, if I can put it that way. I'm not gonna use the word that was abused during uh, the, the height of the COVID pandemic, but you know, we, we come out better, if I put it that way. It's almost like we, we, re, we, we learn new things that makes us go faster, and we almost leapfrog a lot of stuff. So I enjoy that post-mortem experience of the crisis. I, I would concur with that in terms of, um, it's a very South African trait, right? We have this natural innate resilience to us. And, and uh, somebody who we had on our platform recently, Jessica Boonstra, who started uh, Yebo Fresh, um, we had her in our studio recently, and she was saying, you know what, we speak about this kind of 75% unemployment in the 18 to 24 year um, band in our, in our population, but what people don't realize is they're not just sitting on their hands. They're not just they're not just sitting in street corners or you know chewing gum and and they're hustling. They're doing things. And I mean, she's very much at the coalface there, you know, dealing and interacting and engaging with those folks. And there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of stuff going on below the below the line. So, Carl, I mean, then with you last year, round about. April, May, you know, we engaged on this, this survey and it, I mean, it was a dog show, let's just put it that way. And then, you know, trying to engage with government, that was even more of a dog show. <laughs> and, and it was very frustrating in terms of just trying to get government to be more efficient with the distribution of all these amazing funds that everybody's getting excited about. And it didn't really quite pan out that way. So with that as a backdrop, how do you feel? It's a complete mixed bag, and I must tell you, it's been a it's an em been an emotional roller coaster for the business, not just personally. I mean, personally, we've been through the like roller coaster, but at a business level, I mean, we spoke then last year, April last year, only ten percent of businesses were allowed to be open in South Africa, the level five. So, and as a business, we only collect in businesses trade, so we were ninety percent down. So, you can imagine the existential crisis we went through in April last year. Yeah, it recovered. It bounced back incredibly quickly. So within three, four months, we were back at 70, 80 percent of where we were pre-COVID. We had probably record months, October, November, December. We had second wave hit us in January. We were down 15 percent of where we expected to be. And then our third wave, we were down 15 percent again. So you can just see the extent of how much the economy was closed last year versus this year. Okay, so much less impact on the economy. But the thing is, when you're running a business, you sort of build this momentum. And for me, business is about momentum. And you, know, you can't always put your finger on it, but you just feel there's like a positivity and metrics are improving and volumes are growing and your brand's building. And, and it's just every time you have a lockdown, momentum is just taken out. It's like I take you out the knees every single time. So y if I had to look back on COVID, we're a much stronger business now. We went through the... <laughs> the stress test of our business and we survived fortunately but and we've seen a lot more new business come through we've seen new partnerships being forged we've more digital than we ever were uh, it forced us to rethink our face-to-face -face model now more online so so we fundamentally changed how we do things and we more efficient and we better than we ever were but it's still at an emotional level it, it's a it's a constant struggle and you've got to feel that some parts of the economy have done incredibly well as a result of COVID. I'm talking about, you know, with the work from home shift, the gym equipment guys and the home guys, and the, uh, they're flying, building materials flying. And then you get other parts of the economy, tourism is just decimated. You know, the the sit-down restaurants have largely been decimated to a large extent. And you just feel like they've made it through the first wave, they've made it through the second wave, and that they're just, it's just a constant battle for these guys, just to keep head above water. So, so the sex economy that are struggling, the other guys that are flying, and 
So it's not like you're coming out with a hell of a positive view going, everything's fine, everything's not fine. But, but we soldier on. Yeah, I, l I, we had, uh, I read something in Wired magazine um, that was written by the epidemiologist Larry Brilliant. I don't know if you remember that guy from the early 2000s. He was quite a well-known chap back then. But he was saying he, he terms this as the forever virus. <laughs> and I was like, just don't, don't say things like that. I mean, we, we need good news. Not things like the forever virus, you know. <laughs> so, but um, but nonetheless, I, I do want to. I, I mean, we've got a ton of questions coming in, and, and um, some from international um, uh, shores. And I, I want to get through to some of you guys in the audience. So, so um, what I'm going to ask is that when you do have a question, if you can walk up to the mic and uh, and stand in front of the mic and then ask your question, and then politely go and sit down again <laughs> and if I may ask that you ask a question and and keep it short and not make it into a long soliloquy which would mean that I have to come and jackknife tackle you off of the the mic so um so so I'm gonna start with uh, actually oh, this is so interesting it's a very old friend of mine from Israel and that's Langer girl who um she's asked a question uh, she's at the very early stages of her enterprise uh, in Israel, um, and she's going. She's looking at um, an attempt to raise seed money for essentially a social app, right? And um, she wants to know what is necessary to have, or, or, or in terms of having the raw material to go and approach potential funders. What does she need, and uh, and what is the the sort of bare minimum basics? Is it like a PowerPoint presentation or do you need to have something more tangible? Cora, let's start with you. Th thank you. Uh, um, look, firstly, I, I think uh, uh, she, she's sitting in one of the uh, biggest VC communities in the world, in Israel, it's bigger than ours, so maybe she should ask some of her colleagues out there. I think it's the second largest after Silicon Valley, if memory serves me correctly. Um, look, I, I think she sounds like she's a, she, she needs seed capital, this series one, which is a totally different ball game from what Carl referred to earlier on. This is now, this is now the spear of the tip. This is, this is for people that you, you literally need hair on your teeth uh, to kind of do series one there, just to just give the spectrum, okay? Um, because there's no, there's no data, there's there's no proof of there's no proof of concept. It's plus it's a platform, right? Uh, so what, what is required in that case is firstly, there must be a very solid business case. Um, and, and ideally, there should be a, a proof of concept, so the app must have been done so that the person who's, because this is not going to be a financial institution, I can put my hand on heart and say that, this is going to be an angel that can play with the thing and buy into what the benefits of this thing does, right? So the, the, the uh, business plan needs to be solid. Um, and there needs to be a clear understanding of what uh, problem does this thing fix, or what value does it create, and where's the money going to come from? What, how do you monetize its benefits? That needs to be very clear. Uh, so it can be tested because mo most of these things, it's like, uh, um, how can I put it? And, and I know in South Africa, people have a lot of frustration with this notion of there are a lot of South Africans that have similar ideas, and they're not getting traction. Uh, because they're not getting support from institutions or they don't know angels and stuff like that. So I, I want to explain it like this so that people can understand what, what is at play here. So imagine, Fred, um, this gentleman over here. I don't know him from Adam, right? I'm an angel investor and he comes and approaches me with an idea like that. Okay? So now what type of information do you think I should reasonably expect from him? I don't know from Adam and he wants five million. Not that I have it, but just think about it. <laughs> like, like, th you, you give two million to say a family member because you know the great grandmother and you know you know the whole pool and you know where all the money pockets are sitting and it's not working and it still takes you like a few months to say yes to a bar to a family member so now imagine in this situation i know this guy from adam he doesn't bank with me i don't have a bank you know. his name is adam actually is your name adam snap <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay, I'll change. I'll call you Sipo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just th think about what what does it mean? You know, if someone that you've never met Carl in your life, um, and you have an idea, and you know that Carl is a VC guy, right? So, 
What do you think Carl should reasonably expect information from you for him to write out a check for one million? Just, just think about it that way. Like, think about the bank, you go to the bank, you take out car finance, right? You're banking with the bank, and you're going to, they have your money, and then they still want you to fill in how many forms for car finance? Plus, if you don't pay them, they take the car. What is he gonna take? You understand? So that's why the information gap between what is required for a startup seed versus what is expected from the entrepreneur. So you, most of us come with a mindset of there are two uh, uh, problems in the how we engage with the startup slash entrepreneur community. One is people compare seed capital, the information requirements to that of borrowing money from a bank who they bank with, who also has their as a car as a security or the house or the bond as security. It's not the same thing. It so couldn't be further away. The second mistake that I've seen when people talk about equity investing is people think that because you can, I can buy five Nasper shares ne, today, but no, because I just see Carl is there, you are there. If I change my mind tomorrow, I sell the shares and I walk away. Maybe I lose 10%, it's not so bad. Ne? Now try that in an unlisted business. There's no selling tomorrow. You stuck with that stuff. You understand? So, and Nasdaq is well traded. They had 10 years of fi financial history there. The CEOs are known. We don't, I don't know Sipo from anywhere. And if I ask you, you also don't know him. It's just like he's in the community. So it, it's kind of, it's a lot more complex. And I know it's very frustrating for entrepreneurs, but I think it's important for entrepreneurs to understand what is the lens through which financial institutions or investors look at your business and what is required because I know it's frustrating because the people say you, there are too much information, there are too many forms. So I like Carl's digitizing the process. <laughs> so basically, Annette, it's going to be really hard for you, <laughs> for you to get money, particularly from Cora. So go and speak yeah, to some of your folks <laughs> in Israel. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's where it's going to come from. C Carl, I've got, got a question for you now, just to... Um, I mean, feel free to comment on that if you'd like, but uh, maybe just one comment on that. So I, I meet lots of entrepreneurs who are also at the startup stage and they're all looking for capital and all the rest. And you know, I mean, the one thing I said in up front is, you know the story about the about breakfast, about the chicken and the egg, I mean, the, 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 so the chicken and the, and the pig. So when you have bacon and eggs, the chicken was involved but the pig was committed, okay? <laughs> and as an entrepreneur, you have to decide if you're the chicken or the pig. And a lot of entrepreneurs want to do these little things on the side and raise capital. If you're just involved, it's not enough. You have to be committed. And so what, what they tend to look for is, you know, what, are you ta what risk are you taking, which is the point you're making. So if I'm going to lose money because I've given you money and it doesn't work, what are you going to lose? A and you don't want to be at to the level at which they can't sleep at night, but there needs to be something on the line. They can't just walk away because then you left carrying a, a shell with nothing in it. So... So that, that's the one thing. And the other thing I'd say is build networks. And the other thing Corey mentioned was credibility. If you don't know who the person is, how are you going to trust the person? So where do I get my credibility from? And what some very successful entrepreneurs have done in Cape Town is they've built good networks. They've built an advisory board. They've built a board which has a level of governance. Um, they, the people are putting their name to the business. So you know, I might not know Adam or Sipo, but but I can certainly know someone else who's on the advisory board and has a sense of the industry and has track record. So, you know, build your network around you um, alongside of everything else. Good answer. So, um, yeah, to quote uh, an overquoted book, uh, have skin in the game, I suppose. Um, Nick Rosley, who's also a very um, active member of the Heavy Chef community from Julep, uh, he's asked the question, how often will you advise an ambitious business to not raise capital? Uh, and I'm going to hand that to you again, Carl. I'm more a debt guy than an equity guy, but, <laughs> but I'll, st I'll share my view. So Throw your hat in the one thing I, I learned many years ago, people say to me, equity is for life. You know, once you give it away, you don't get it back. Eh? So, and, and the other thing is, if I look at my and not success, my failures in many cases. Most of the time I've failed in businesses is when I've had an issue with my partners, sh other shareholders. So, you know, especially in the early stage, you tend to sell your soul, so you give the equity away and bring people in and all the rest because you don't have many options, uh, but often you live to regret it. So, 
you know, the last place you should try and raise money is through equity with someone else. Bootstrap as long as possible would be my, my advice. It's not always possible. Sometimes if it's a high capital intensive business and requires a lot of capital, then you've got to pick partners, but then spend a lot of time understanding what that partner is. And when you pick a partner, don't pick a partner when they're in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> understand the like in a bad mood. So everyone is, everyone's a nice guy when everything's look, look going forward. But when the chips are down, how do people behave? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I've seen, I've seen businesses behave in very strange ways as partners when things aren't going well. So understand their bad days, not their good days. We had, yeah, we had a good conversation or a good chat just before this started about how do you behave when you, you're going through failure? How, you, how do you behave when you're going through that trough of sorrow? What happens to your, your uh, constitution when you're faced with real challenges? And I think that's a huge thing. It's, you know, it's part of the, the sort of the 360 makeup of an entrepreneur, grit, resilience, and so on and so forth, but also just how we respond to all the multitude of chan challenges that we're facing with, so that we, we're faced with. So Mongezi Mutati, who's the CEO of Wordstart, and he's also a good friend of, of, of Heavy Chefs. He's, um, uh, he's a real legend in the, in the industry. He's asked the question, what are some create, <laughs> what are some, and I'm for sure that you've seen some of this, Cora, um, given your lens, but what are some creative ways to reach out to funders? I mean, besides just the sort of email and the pitch deck, like, are, are there any things that come to mind in terms of things that have kind of, you know, struck your eye or grabbed your attention uh, in the past? Look, I, I, I think the first thing for any entrepreneur to do if you are about to start a business or you're going on the capital raising trail, capital, when I say capital, I'm going to mean equity, mezzanine, and Carl's finance. I'm talking about all of that, right? So... So when you, when you embark on that journey, uh, you need to do your research and figure out, see who's playing in this industry, who provides money to, if you're an SME, if you know your business is gonna be SME or versus a startup, do the research. And uh, quite a few of your speakers in your recipes have mentioned this is also. Um, understand who plays where, which funder play you. Now you heard where Carl plays. I don't play at all, but who, where do the banks play? Where does government play? Where do the venture capital funds play? You know, understand the picture of where the people are playing and understand their criteria like what Carl has mentioned. Because once you under understand where they play, then you can come up with creative things, if that makes any sense. Because it doesn't help, you know, you s do sending a creative thing to one of the big institutionalized 100-year-old banks that is, s you know, vibey. Because, I mean, it's the stuff that you send to Carl that will excite him. You see what I'm saying? So it's almost like you must know your customer, being the b institution that's going to fund you, and then design something creative around how their DNA is, but you must understand what their financing rules are. Yeah, absolutely. I, it just made me think, s sorry, Carl, you were going to say something? No, I just support that. I, I, it's about mandates. I mean, even when we look for funding at our institutional level, you know, they do all the different mandates. Some do 5 to 10 million, some will do 10 to 20, some will look for certain sectors, some will... So, so those mandates, they're quite clearly defined if, if you look for them properly. I think just... Uh, and just to touch upon the point of creativity, and, and it kind of backdates to the previous question around, you know, an app, one of the previous questions around an app, is, is there, also, there are ways, there are mechanisms, even before you've kind of you know, you, you've started generating funding and that sort of thing to, in this day and age, to be able to create the product, at least in a, in a, in a real kind of MVP format. So one of the recipes we've got on our, our platform is by Roger Norton. He talks about lean iteration and the ability for people nowadays to, to right at the first start at idea stage to at an extreme, um, uh, you know, economical level be able to create something that's compelling, that works on a phone, if you, you know, that you can show people, and be creative around you know, demonstrating the use case and the user interface of the things that you want to do. And that, I think, goes a long way, at least the effort in that you put in that. And you know, speaking to the skin in the game and the, you know, the sweat, the energy, the real kind of thinking and the research that you've done, I think it's really, really important if you do want to be creative around these things, um, just and to grab attention. Um, okay, Fred, Fred, can I just jump quickly? Yeah, so, yeah, so the one thing I think 
and this is why we're more tactical, is all about FOMO, this fear of missing out. <laughs> and, and particularly when you're young and you're early and, you, and you're creating a story, you've got to have multiple horses in the race and they've all got to feel like they're going to lose out. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's this whole thing of, you know, if you go knock on doors on a cold call, no one wants you. And I've watched so many businesses where at startup stage they can't raise capital. Then they get to a point where they invest all of a sudden everybody wants them and, then, and the price just goes to the roof and everyone wants to climb in. And, and I've seen one incredibly successful business in, in South Africa, and I hope I don't misquote them. I don't know if you guys know Intersect. Mm, yeah. So Intersect, I think, Skulk. yeah, Skulk. In the early stages they went looking for capital, couldn't find capital in the early days and then managed to grow themselves through it without requiring capital, and <laughs> by then with the investment community missed out. And they're a, they're a massive, massive was Sequoia international. <laughs> Sequoia moved in, parked e their tanks on their lawn. Exactly, so how do you get that story across to the potential investors that we might be the one you miss out on? Yeah, That's very cool, I like that, sneaky, I like that. Um, so I, I wanna, uh, I'm gonna ask if there's anybody in the audience who has a question, just to put their hand up, and then uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do the walk of fame. Uh, <laughs> to the, <laughs> I can see everyone's feeling a little bit sheepish. It's okay, we'll warm you up. I'm just gonna, okay, so Philip, we've got you there. I'm gonna ask one question from the audience, and then you're next, okay. Um, so, Jeepers, we've got tons of questions coming from online audience. We see you guys. So, we've got Kaylee Africa, uh, who's the CEO of Aya.Africa. And, um, <laughs> and this is a great question. I'm going to put it to both of you. You can slice it and dice it as you want. Can you ask the government to create funds for startups, grant money, so that the economy can actually come back? What is that, what is that going to look like? And, uh, and that has some real potential impact on actual economy. Carl, I know you've got an opinion on, <laughs> on this <laughs> stuff. So we'll hand it to you and then Cora. Yeah, yeah, so. Sure. I don't know Free where to start. I don't know for where to people, start. For the entrepreneurs. Yeah, so, so almost every press release we put out is exactly what we ask for. So we went through, obviously went through COVID. In the middle of COVID, we put a paper to government which said, create a fund which is part grant, part, part debt, which can kick off to new entrepreneurs and to existing entrepreneurs. And I can tell you, it didn't see the light of day uh, because there were too many vested interests between the banks and government, for one. Two, and, and I'll maybe it's a bit controversial, but you know, we have a five trillion rand economy. They're saying 5,000 5, billion rand economy. I think the government commits 3, 4 billion rand a year to SME sector. And the latest round for the finance minister, they're allocating the money away from the SME sector to other sectors because they're short elsewhere. Okay, so uh, ask where the commitment to SMEs really is in this country. That's, yeah. And maybe it's controversial, but I don't think we should rely on government. I think we have a very well-established corporate sector. We have a very well-established business sector in South Africa. Uh, we do have VC-type funds, not to the level we have in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. But there is capital. There are sponsors. There are supporters. We've got to make our own way. I, I don't think we can rely on government to survive. And, and the reality is, if you look across Africa, people do well in Africa despite their governments, not because of their governments. So... We can't create a sense where we're now dependent on government putting money into the system so that we can create entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. There are enough other avenues. We've just got to tap it properly. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's just absolutely imperative. And it's also why this is so important that we have communities like this and people like yourselves interacting with each other and providing support for each other. Because this is, it, it has to be bottom-up change, right? And that, that has precedent across the world in other regions. So, um, Cora, I don't know if you want to add to that. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to add and be contrarian. <laughs> yes. uh, 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 look, I, 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 uh, as you know, Fred, I, I sit on the Investment Committee of the National Empowerment Fund, and we have two, at least once a week, we have an investment committee that lasts any two to three hours. And I can tell you that deploying the capital in a very efficient manner 
It includes a grant funding slug from the, de from the Department of Trade and Industry. And then the reason why uh, we don't know is because we don't celebrate the success. So if someone uh, uh, gets money that is blended grant funding, zero interest rate from a government institution, slick with slick terms in a very quick turnaround time, it doesn't get showcased. Nobody knows. I sit there quietly. I'm not going to tell people. Is this mental? I don't know why. But why not? I don't know why it's not set up. So people don't say 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 about it. There are two separate funds that are deploying at a rapid rate. One specifically for the situation in KZN. There's like literally a two-week turnaround time, uh, which which, uh, which is also supported by Cestria, by the way. So it's almost like the National Empowerment Fund deploys ahead of Cestria, almost like it's bridging the delay, as you would know, that they experience at Cestria. And then there's also a specific ge general recovery fund, uh, which is sort of linked to businesses that are under severe strain or suffered, they were almost decimated during COVID. And the, the speed, it's, a, it's very fast, the rate at which they do it. So, so I, think, I think that because what the manner in which the government is structured is that, yes, I agree, totally agree with Carl's observations around the SME section. There are other pockets where the capital is being deployed, which includes grant funding. One of the, the, the reasons why people don't go there is because of the perception it's slow, which it's not. People, ask, people don't like the, the transformation lens and the gender lens that the government puts on the transactions, right? They just want to get on with it. Um, and so people run away from it because, of, but I can tell you there are some really compelling deals that are cro crossing uh, th those institutions. So, uh, I mean, on that note, and to the question from, from IA Africa, I mean, they, I, I, you know, we know them. They have a diverse team that that owns it and that has uh, stake in it. You know, how would they access some of that funding? It's, it's very easy. Go to the nationalempowerment.org website, pick your section, fill in the form. It's online, and off you go. Simple. It's very simple. Free money. It's yeah. very very simple. You just have your ducks in the row. They ask very detailed questions again about sector, economy, shareholding making sure that people are gelling, there's not going to be fighting down the line. Uh, and they offer great technical assistance if you don't, if you need specialist uh, expertise in certain areas. So I think please do check it out. Business Partners also does them, especially for those people that want blended financing. You know, when, you, when you're not sure, and, and I, I fully agree with Carl, it's about giving equity away up front. So they do this patient uh, capital in the middle that, you know, takes payment holidays, that allows you to go through your difficult stuff and then you pay them later at the flexible interest rate, they switch off the interest clock and they switch it on again. So all those type of fancy stuff, and sorry if, the, if I'm speaking language that sounds a bit foreign, but I don't know what the other I, I would is. thoroughly encourage people to go and check out those options. I mean, business partners, we know them very well. They're an incredible bunch of guys, mm. super professional, really good folks, lots of heart, and lots of time to sit with you, and really, if you've got a good proposal, you know, they'll listen to you. Mm. So, I, I mean, I, I love that, I love that, First of all, I love there's two two opposing views okay. here, but but y you know you're meeting in the middle. Mm. I, d I think both of you are correct here, that you know whilst is huge amount of frustration in terms of the efficiency in certain areas, there are also you know good stories, mm. frustratingly untold mm. stories which we need to work on. Mm. Um, but there's also a lot of good people out there that are you know that are available uh, to to you for for funding. So, look, I mean, we're going to follow up with an article about this, and we'll put some of the links uh, on the website, and, and you guys can go and check them out. Um, Philip, do you want to get up to the mic, and, and let's hear your question, sir? Uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Can you hear? Okay. Just speak loudly. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Philip. Um, I've had the project to meet Fred Wright uh, a few months ago, amazing guy, and um, Carl and Cora, you guys motivated me to start a venture capital firm, <laughs> which has <laughs> been the most amazing experience, but uh, the question I'm going to ask is very connected to what I've experienced when it comes to KYC. Um, I got into a business with a guy, we did a franchise but I didn't have enough resources to find out who he really is. And down the line, things just started falling apart. So how do you guys deal with um, KYC? How do you deal with anti-money laundering? 
because it's a really big thing and people's faces don't really say much. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, just answer, I'll ask another question. Look, <laughs> look uh, uh, for th for the areas that I'm I'm involved in and have been involved in the past, it's it's the highly regulated section. So, uh, KYC, AML, those type of checks need to be done. It's mandatory. Uh, typically, you know, uh, if if the if the entrepreneur, the business that we are dealing with, has a banking relationship with a, with a with a bank, with the other bank, because I was mainly private equity funds or debt funds or so. Um, so if they're in a relationship with the, with, the with another financial institution, we also take comfort from the fact that that bank is subject to the same regulation. So the chances of us dealing with this person that hasn't been FICAT, RICAT, KYC, or AML, is <laughs> Well played. <laughs> um, so so I, I think it's also making sure that when you're investing you're in good company, uh, so sort of that you know that the people that you're investing with, or th if you are looking at a jockey, always try and make sure that there's someone else that comes from your school of thought, but with a different lens, looking at the same person, because sometimes you are blindsided, and then I don't see something, and Carl <coughs> sees it and says, Kora, watch out for this, that type of thing. Add to that, so yeah, there's the KYC part, which is identifying the individual. Who is the person, and where do they come from? More importantly in business is the reference checks behind the scenes. What's their track record? So you know, I do a lot of informal reference checks. So fortunately, I've got a broad network, so if I have to do business with a new person or a new company, rather than using their reference checks, do your own reference checks. Mm. Do you know so-and-so? How would they treat you? How don't they treat you? you know, those reference checks are worth so much more than, than what you're going to see on a piece of paper or mm. that's formally presented. Mm. And even in business, I mean, mm. uh, even credit committees when they're assessing deals, the first thing they do is, do you know Carl? Mm. What's he like? Mm. What did he do before? Mm. Has he mm. failed? How do you treat people? You know, it's, mm. it it's gets done on me all the time. And <laughs> I'm sure. Philip, you got one. Or you got one more question. I oh, okay, okay. I had three. Ma no, you got one more <laughs> question. <laughs> is um, so the second one is, how do we teach startups? Because I've struggled with this a lot. Where you consult for a startup, but they don't understand the thesis behind venture capital firms, and that they say they still send presentations in their word format. And sometimes they can't raise the funds. So how do we get to a point where we teach them how exact what to do without wasting a lot a lot of our times and resources? Because I think today in South Africa we have if you're based in the city, you have really good access. But if you're in the outskirts, there's literally no one who can give information on how to do your presentations and you this has a great module for Fred. I was about to say, <laughs> send them to heavyshift.com. <laughs> okay, I okay. kid you not, there's actually a really good, um, there's a brilliant recipe on Heavy Chef uh, that l was, it went live on Monday by Alexandra Fraser, uh, Fraser Consulting, and, and um, you know, she's just an absolute legend, and she goes through all the various processes of what you need to do. And then we also have a couple of other recipes, uh, Andrea Bermert uh, from Knife Capital, talking about all the various processes and procedures. So, uh, heavychef.com, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Okay, cool. um, okay guys, so um, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna t uh, take it to the online audience again, uh, and then we'll ask another question. Okay, we've got another question in the, in the audience. So... Um, Julia Robson, uh, who's the co-founder or the founder of DNMK Sports, she's an eSports superstar, she's actually quite a celeb. Um, she's in the audience, hey Julia. Um, what advice do you have for Gen Z and millennials who might own a business or startup in a field that's relatively new or niche, like eSports, in finding their feet financially through investments and smart business practices, considering it seems harder to communicate traditional projections in a niche that hasn't really caught on yet so it's kind of like bleeding edge kind of stuff i mean that's th that's quite a that's a great question it's also quite a tricky question so um yeah if you want to catch the ball i'll jump in here first i think so yeah, particularly new niches where you do, where you bleeding edge not even leading edge, bleeding edge i've tended to find the best audience with high net worth individuals rather than funds so yeah and a lot of the seed seed investment that takes place is high net worth individuals who've got capital 
where they say it's a cool idea, I buy into the individual and I'm prepared to put a little bit of money behind you and test it. It's like a free option for them because it's a tiny relative to their total wealth. But as soon as you start getting to the formal space, the night capitals and all the rest, too early stage, um, no proven track record, not a proven industry yet, all that sort of stuff. So it tends to be more, go, uh, my suggestion would be go and find a, a 30 year old who's made a ton of money who understands the space and he says he's prepared to give him, give you 0.1% of his wealth to go and test it. That's where I'd start. Good answer. Do you want to have a... Uh, look, I, I also the, the other option for, for, for accelerating potentially the growth um, is also just to, to get an understanding of why are why is why is why, are, why is the adoption going at a slower rate and then rejig the marketing if I can put it that way, and the second option is especially if it's profitable, it just needs volume, and the other option is to think about innovative uh, people you can partner with that will automate that will bring you traffic. You, you see what I'm saying? So I don't know the creator. So if you if you're in a fitness thing, fitness online uh, or s uh, app, or what, uh, like the person you're talking about, maybe uh, partner up with Discovery Help. I don't know, can they, can you get extra points or whatever, however that loyalty thing works like. Encouraging I can people see you're not a gamer. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know but what I'm saying? But, so you, but yeah, I think, I think there's something to add on to that in that with, with these bleeding edge kind of categories that you almost need to sell the category as much as you're selling the, the business because the category, for example, esports is massive overseas. I mean, if you think about, you know, all these stadiums that are being filled with people playing Apex Legends and whatever other whole new freaking game that's CSGO, that's old school. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so you, you, you know, you, you have all these amazing things which are happening internationally and say, well, look, you know, we had this nascent... Uh, um, environment here in South Africa that, that w you, you can tap into um, and you sell a category. And I think there, there's a huge gap for things like, and I mean, other nascent areas like, you know, like um, g a gene editing, you know, CRISPR, if you, I mean, you can speak to an Uber driver in San Francisco and they'll tell you all about what their investments and uh, their latest CRISPR, you know, startup is because it's such a hot topic. But in South Africa, people don't even know what CRISPR is, you know, and, and I think that this is the sort of thing that we've got to get good at is selling the category and trying to find smart, you know, baby entrepreneurs that are willing to get into that thing, have the appetite for risk and really get get amongst it. Right, just maybe just to add, you know, I, I've seen a lot of these um, creative, no, ideas that look and feel like, like ado adopted versions of what we have. Uh, in the U.S. in particular, and to some extent, uh, Western Europe. One of the things that is it's, it's problematic in South Africa and, and, and the rest of the continent is that we have a certain demographic profile. So you, you must understand the demographics profile and affordability. What does middle class mean? How, what is affordability in Europe and, and the U.S. versus here? So m many people, quite a few of these um, or platforms come up with stuff where South Africa's affordability price points is it doesn't get there, so you always struggle with uh, volume. So and, and the price point is a problem. So we would just uh, for people that are uh, you know many people have raised the issue with me about alternative protein, alternative protein. You know that this whole alternative protein uh, uh, movement and veganism, uh, which I, I absolutely love that stuff, right? So big into food stuff. Um, um, and why isn't it taken off in South Africa? Why? Mm. And look at the price point of vegan meals and look at the price point of chicken in South Africa. Why would the average South African, right, go and buy a vegan meal of the 60 million people? How many people do you think can afford to swap out chicken for a vegan burger? Look at the price point. So there are a lot of those instances in South Africa where we have, we import things that appear cheap, you know, but in South Africa, those things are completely unaffordable. You know, the fight in the wallet in South Africa, the struggle is real, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's such a good point. Got to recall. Now, I just want to go back to the, the, to the previous discussion around the nascent industry. So uh, what we see now, so obviously in Silicon Valley, they've got a very well-established VC sector. And a lot of it's from the original founders of big businesses, the Ebays, the, the you know, PayPal's, the 
reinvesting back in the ecosystem. Okay, so it's their capital that's going into the Andreessen Horowitz's, the Sequoia Capitals, the, and a lot of that's capital has already been made in that sector that's being reinvested back into new startups. And we, we're not quite there yet in South Africa where we, we still need some good exits for South African businesses where the guys are, and you've got the likes of the Yokos, the Ozos, all raising like proper money at the moment. And at some point, five years time, there'll be some exits and maybe they put money back into the ecosystem. But we need, we need those guys with those mindsets to put money back in the ecosystem. That's a great point. There's a wonderful story for those of you interested about um, Estonia. We had the Estonian crew here in, s in South Africa quite recently, well I think they're still here, doing their roadshow about the Estonian um, citizenship. And uh, it's quite interesting. And the whole thing was started, I mean, very quick story is this guys from Skype, three of their founding members were from Estonia. They sold, they got all their you know, billions of dollars. Instead of going sitting on a yacht somewhere, they went back and got stuck into the ecosystem. And mm. The incredible impact of that is over a very relatively short space of time, you have all these, I mean, quite literally unicorns that have evolved out of that ecosystem where they're reinvesting into it. So, I mean, it's quite an exciting thing that you're saying, Carl, that, you know, all it takes is one or two. I mean, you, you have stories of, of um, you know, Silicon Valley with with D D Dave Hewlett and Bill, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard you know, reinvesting and, and these sort of almost generations and the batons being passed down and the interconnectedness, which is just phenomenal. And I think yeah. we'll see that, right? So you have the likes of the Vinnie Lingham's here and the Justin Stanford's and all those guys that, that, are, that are building those ecosystems. Mm. Yeah. So th that just needs to be extended. 100%. Um, okay, so we've got a question in the audience. Thank you for having me. Um, my name's Ian. I'm from a fintech called Electrum Payments. And I just want to connect two things that were said earlier. My question is, you said bootstrap as long as possible, but how do you decide when to get funding, and how do you know you're not missing out? <laughs> that is a great question. And by the way, that is like a composite of about 10 questions that have come in here. So thank you and for asking that question. Um, uh, thanks <laughs> for the question. Look, I, I, I think, uh, and I'm going to give you the lens, the answer through my lens is a financial person, right? So firstly, what I would do if, if, as we are bootstrapping, you're continuously running these 18 month for 24 month models to see when you're going to run out of cash. So that you see, on a, like literally it's on a monthly basis, you have a spreadsheet of 24 lines that shows, you know, because you know what your income is going to be and your expenses are certain, you're bootstrapping, there's no vol wild swings, right? So then you literally run this spreadsheet to say, over the next 24 months, what my situation will look like? This client comes on board if this one drops off clear visibility in the top line and the, uh, the, the, bottom, the cost is, is, is not too volatile. Run the thing. Then you can see in month six, okay, I'm going to have to put in 200K. Do I want to? Can I afford it? Month two, I have to put in 300K. Do I want to? Because if you see there's going to be a period where you, over a period of say six months, the total amount that you need, say it's one million, and you go, I don't want to get there, right? Then you start the application process for investing now. Because you don't want to, you know that story that they say, the banks give you money when you don't need it. So you start, to, you want to get caught in that situation where you are, you know, you're trying to gain momentum in the business and you have to deal with this long, complicated uh, finance approval process. Because I'm assuming in that case, you're not going to want the 250K uh, Carl is talking about. You're going to end up being in, because you can't ask 250K every month for 24 months, right? So I'm assuming you're going to end up in a situation where you know what the total requirement is and now in this stage we're starting to hamper your ability to reinvest in the business to do the add-ons. So my suggestion is that run the models up front, get the documentation ready and pull the trigger when you're ready because if the person gives you an offer that you don't like and just don't go to one person, um, if, you're, if you're ready to pull the trigger and the person gives you too much or they want too many rights, you trade them off and then you say no thank you, I'd rather do this. If that makes any sense, don't wait for the last minute because you don't want to you know, be negotiating with the head over the barrel. Ian, good to see you. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Corey's absolutely right. So you never want to ask for money when you, when you need it. <laughs> you always want to ask for money when you don't need it. So, yeah, they always look at burn rates and they always look at, mm. yeah, how much time you've got, how many, what's your runway look like? Mm. You've got 10 months, 12 months, 18 months. And the bizarre thing is, 
when you are looking for capital, the longer you're bur the, the more capital you have in the bank, the higher the valuation they'll give you as well. So if they know you've got three months to run, uh, they're going to squeeze you on mm. one thing. If you've got 12 months of cash in the bank and lots of options, you, know, you dictate the terms. It's the opposite. So to answer your question on when to raise the money, I think it's just, it comes down to forecasts. You know. But there are also different approaches to this whole thing. So you know, businesses, most of us that I've been involved in, we very much built to get to profitability quickly and probably been slower growth. So we've been subscale for a long period of time, but we've been profitable. So we haven't had to go out looking for capital all the time. A lot of the fintechs now are the opposite. They're building for, for revenue growth, and, and, bo and bottom line is irrelevant to a large extent. So they've got to tell a great story and show high top line growth, which means you burn a lot of cash very quickly. And you know, then it's just about you get into the cycle of just having to raise more capital and uh, series A, series B, series C, and so it goes. And it's bizarre, because I sat in a, in a conference in, in The Hague in, in uh, Holland, and we sat with a whole bunch of entrepreneurs, CEOs, and it was the Series C group. It's a bunch of guys who are sort of at the Series C level, which is where you're meant to be get to profitability. <laughs> and they were talking about you know, how to get to profitability, and, and the, the gray-haired guy in the room, there's one guy in the room who'd been around the block many times, and he says, why do you want to get to profitability? <laughs> and I looked at him like, he said, as soon as you get to profitability, your valuation halves. And that's pretty true. Because as soon as you're profitable, it's not a multiple of revenue anymore. Now it's a, rev it's a, it's a multiple of profit. So mm -hmm. they actually get into a cycle where you stay unprofitable and you just raise more capital on revenue growth. That's how you grow your valuation. So you've got to decide which approach you want to take. <laughs> are you building a business for profit or are you building a business for valuation and revenue growth? Well, that's quite a <laughs> it's quite a scary thought actually, but it is it is certainly two very kind of binary polar opposite views on how to build a business, right? Um, Qualification, tech, not for I mean, you don't try it elsewhere. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't go to Quora with that. No, don't. It's for tech. We it's for VC we'll tech. Make, we'll make profit in 2035. <laughs> She's gonna send you back in. Um, so so. I think uh, there's a couple more questions from the, the audience, uh, the online audience, and, and if anyone wants to answer, ask a question um, here, yeah, just put your hand up. Um, we've got, uh, I think, quite an important question from Mandla Coupe, who you, you know well, Carl. Um, he works at Retail Capital. And he, Mandla asks, there is a largely untapped township market that needs funding. Right, and I know this is, you know, we've got a few folks from our Kai Leacher small group here. Um, how do we get, uh, how do we get the space to digitize? We asked this question before, and, but I think also, let's ask the question, you know, let's broaden it a bit around how would someone with a business uh, in the communities approach getting or raising capital? I mean, I can speak to our experience more than anything else. So. So our concentration is large in the retail type sector. So it can be spas or shops, it can be liquor traders or any of those sort of things. And I still think there's a there's a behavior challenge at the moment. So it's not so much on the customer side because pretty much everyone's running around with debit cards and are largely banked now. Okay, So you see behavior where they'll pay for cash at the spas or shop, but they'll use their card and pick and pay. So they have the ability to pay by card or mobile payment or whatever is required at the point of sale, so the merchant is not ne necessarily accepting a digital form of payment yet. And it's getting easier and cheaper to do so. So the likes of the mobile point of sale, or now you don't even need the device, you can do it straight on your phone you know, with NFC, with, with tap and go. We've got to somehow got to get that ecosystem developed where they accept digital payments. Once they have that, they have a track record. You know, those customers, within a month of of going digital can access funding through our, our channels. So the barrier to entry is getting lower and lower and lower. I mean, for seven, eight hundred rand, they can be live with, uh, with accepting payments. You've obviously got to get over all the other stuff, which is you know, now I might pop up on SARS's um, tax list and I might uh, various other things, but they're not using cash. They're not running the risk of being, being robbed, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's, a, 
it's an evolution that has to take place. So I think um, a, a, a kind of a follow-up question to that, which is, is related in a sense. Sindile Mabundla, who is the founder of Culture Cycles, he asks, what are some of the key documents and, and the, the I suppose the preparation that's required in order for you to apply for funding. So, for any either one of you, Corey, do you want to take that? Look, I I I think look there's there's, tal, there's Carl's frictionless digital option, um, uh, which many people may not necessarily qualify for because you don't have a you don't have data that you can use, right? So, uh, let me start with the spectrum, uh, uh, Fred. So. Uh, it depends on are you looking for equity, are you looking for mezzanine, are you looking for senior debt, are you a startup, are you series one, are you series two, are you series three, or are you trading small or medium enterprise. So for me, what I would suggest to anyone is, again, if you look at the, 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 the application form uh, and the information requirements on the National Empowerment Fund website, I think you are covered, but you need to have a, a well-articulated business plan that describes what you are what, what do you want the money for? How are you going to use this money? Uh, what is the product service that you sell? The competitor landscape, the shareholding, you know, the governance around the shareholding, depending on which, which of these aspects you are in. Uh, because just because you are a startup uh, versus an existing trading business doesn't mean you must not explain to the people who you're asking to give you money that you have a governance structure in place. You know, this is how the controls an accounting control environment. So you need to write that thing, you know, and it can be like a two page presentation thing because that stuff needs to be due diligence, especially if people want to give you equity. And if people are giving you senior debt, you know, it's a five year deal or whatever the uh, terms are. And the stuff needs to be written. And it unfortunately it's tedious, but it needs to be converted in a quite a detailed format in the document. And I think from there you should be covered. And your financial model, of course. A lot of stuff, obviously, startup level. Once they're trading, the big thing we see with entrepreneurs is they're not good at bookkeeping. Mm. Yeah? A mm. And that's their biggest challenge. Mm. I if they can just keep their own simple books mm. in order, that's a great start. So, and you've got the likes of Zero as a partner. It is easy now. Mm. But I in the old days, people had three sets of books. Yeah, one <laughs> for SARS, one for the bank, and one for themselves. <laughs> now, you know, just get one set of set of mm. accounts that represent your business. The other thing with we see with, re with retail traders is they take cash and they might take card. The cash doesn't go into the till. Okay, mm. the, the cash gets used for all sorts of things like paying suppliers, never goes to the bank account. So how do you prove turnover <laughs> if, you never, if you never show it? So that's why we, we largely base it on card-based turnover, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to start raising capital, you've got to prove that you've got a business that's viable. So you've got to start recording this stuff, and and you've got to get your governance into place so that um, you know people have faith in what you're mm. producing. Once again, I mean, for those of you interested, we have recipes on the mm. platform for zero, for pay fast, for retail capital. All of these things are available to you. You can go and check it out, and it's really easy to go through and learn how to use all these tools and that leave the digital breadcrumbs that allow you know, people to, to very quickly make decisions or for the, the data-based solutions mm. to be able to immediately take effect. So, okay, we've got one or two questions left. Um, and yes, you have a question, sir. Yeah, Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Luko. Uh, so my question is, um, you mentioned uh, the difference between uh, building a business that focuses uh, on quick profitability and one that uh, focuses on uh, evaluation. And uh, so if uh, you're not attracting investors because uh, they think they're gonna uh, make money quickly, um, then like w how are you attracting uh, investors? How, um, how is that business built uh, for them to uh, invest anyway? So I'd like to depend on that, thanks. Good yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, so firstly, I don't think you want to take investors and expect a return in a year or two or three. Okay, so you know, a typical business is going to take minimum three years, probably five years to become a vi proper viable business. Mm. You know, we always say it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. And if you're attracting equity shells into a business that want to return in two years, you've got the wrong investor. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you up front. Mm. 
you need patient capital. You need people who are prepared to walk a road with you. Um, the difference between building for profit and building for revenue comes down to the treadmill you end up on as management and the valuation you put. So if you have a, you know, a reasonable valuation and you bring people in and you prepare to give them a fair slice of equity, they'll be more patient and wait longer to get their return because they have a lower entry point. That makes sense? If you take a startup and get a $100 million valuation on day one, you have to run very fast to try and catch up to the valuation to give a return. It makes sense. So, you know, one, don't overstate your valuation up front when you start taking equity in. And two, attract, attract patient investors, not impatient investors. Mm. Impatient investors, you're going to end up parting ways in somewhere anyway. Mm. Nikki? Hey, just while we wait for Nikki, no, no, Nikki can go stand there, Nikki. Uh, and you can only ask Carla a question. <laughs> Um, just to say uh, um, to, to Lumco, another lens on, uh, to add on what, what Carl is saying is that just remember that if, you, if you're uh, running a business of profitability, it means there's cash dropping out at the bottom, which means you don't have to go equity. You can go to the bank or you can go to Carl and take debt and you don't have to give up shares. There's growing for revenue because there's no money dropping out. You can't go and get debt because there's no way to repay it. So every time you need money, people must delete the, not delete, dilute their shares. So there's a constant, uh, through each round, there's dilution. Your shares become less and less as you bring in new investors. So you need to factor that into account as well. If that makes any sense? Um, a completely different note. Um, single founders and mitigating that risk. And, and how should a single founder approach a potential funder knowing that there's this issue around single funders. Founders, founders. I'm happy to go. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm a firm believer in, in two, minimum two, preferably three people. A and if you look at all the very big successful startups, they've all had two, three, many cases, three founders. Uh, I don't think one person covers all bases. And you also don't have the sounding board that you need, and you also don't know what your blind spots are. So, and I can speak to when we started the RCS business, there was myself had an analytical background, stats background, another partner who was, um, had come out of training the people side, the empathetic side of the business, and my other partner who was ex-banker, very financial driven, and the battles we had, not good battles, not bad battles, good battles, just in terms of like you get to the end of the year and you go, we, we, we should give a bonus. Everyone agrees, I give a bonus. Oh, one month. And she goes, are you crazy? Do you know how hard they've worked this year? They should get at least three months. And so it goes. And the, so, so you end up having debates at a founder level which are valuable for the business, which is very hard to have yourself. Yeah. You tend to have one lens on everything whenever you approach a situation. So, you know, and founders you trust. People you can... Have the battle with who you play the ball, not the man, uh, or not the person. So uh, I'm a firm believer you, to be a successful business, you need preferably three founders with, with complementary skills, not the same. You don't want three CAs in the room. You want complementary skills. Cora, do you want to add to that? Nikki can just call Carl. Yeah. He can be like the <laughs> virtual partner for the meantime while she dry runs her partners. <laughs> I, think, I think, I mean, there's a great point that you made earlier, I think, about sponsors and having people, because I, I think, Nikki, to your point, I mean, I'm a single founder of Heavy Chef, right? So I own 80% of the company. I have two other individuals who I'm in business with that you actually know, Louis and Mike, and they are my best friends, but they also are flipping annoyingly irritatingly persistent about their opinions and I think to that point they have enough weight in heavy chef and skin in the game that they are able to knock me back and say dude sort that out you need to understand this or you know just give me proper perspective where you know, maybe I, I don't get it enough from my team or, or you know other people don't feel comfortable with it and I think it's important to have I like the word sponsor. I think it, you know, it feels almost like Alcoholics Anonymous, which, by the way, is kind of what we are. Entrepreneurship is just crazy. You know, it's like we need support group.
for each other and you need to call a sponsor when you you're in trouble you know so to have people potentially with skin in the game that that do help you certainly has helped me anyway that's for, you know, for a little bit of perspective yeah and maybe to add to that many of the young the young entrepreneurs that are building businesses have put advisory boards together which is fairly common practice but they brought people in who've got weight yeah. you know, if they're prepared to listen to their opinions and not just fold them off Great. <laughs> good choice. Done. Very good choice. You know she scrooks for nooks, so she'll take you down if she disagrees with you. So um, in, in the best possible way, I'm gonna, we, we're running out of time, guys, so I've got one or two questions left. I've got an absolutely a, a humding of a question from Paul Kirsten, the founder of Workshop 17, actually, and he sent in a question from, um, uh, from online. He's asked... How do you value a business for investment when COVID messed up the past financial year, but at the same time opens opportunities for the future? Which is a great question. Uh, it's, it's, actually qu it's actually not so complicated as it sounds. Um, many businesses are having the same problem. You'll see it happening on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So what most people are doing is rebasing to 2019, and using 2019 as the forecast to forecast for tw f up to 2021, 2022, and it's quite easy to check because you just keep checking on a month-to-month -month basis. How far are you off the trajectory? How far is the forecast of what you had seen you did uh, pre-COVID? So it's you, you rebase to, to pre-COVID, and you almost 2020 becomes the X. Gotcha. Okay. I guess you got to make sure you see it, you exist on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Okay? You so, so there's no, yeah. Then, yeah. there's no, there's no risk that you're not going to survive the other side. But, but every business is made up of goodwill. Mm -hmm. So whilst the profit might not be there and you won't get the multiple, you know, there's an element of goodwill that still exists regardless. So uh, I mean, and the other thing I mentioned earlier was FOMO. So we actually went to the market in the middle of COVID last year to a bunch of DFI type investors to say, if we took in capital, would you come in? And we had enough people around the table who were prepared to put a f decent valuation on the business, despite the fact that we, at that point, weren't profitable. So you know, if, if you've got a track record in the market, if you've got a brand in the market, and, you've, and you're looking for capital, and you've got more than one bidder, then you should get a fair valuation. You won't get necessarily get your top valuation. But uh, as I say, COVID, didn't destroy people's dreams; it just deferred them. So it's just, it's just add a time on. Yeah, I think. I mean, again, we live in weird and wonderful times. Even us, heavy chef cheapers, last year was an absolute dog show for us. It was really tough. But you know, you figure it out. You've got to muscle it through. And and I think there are, yeah, there's ways of of maneuvering through this. And um, and I think you can also reframe it in a way that can become quite compelling in terms of playing to your strengths and looking at what you what value you can create for the marketplace um, guys we we almost out of time is there any is there a last question from the crew we've got one more question there we go so full disclosure I also work at retail capital <laughs> welcome <laughs> yeah, this is a question for Cora <laughs> Depending on who you speak to, South Africa is moving from one economic crisis to the next, right? Um, so my question is, well, firstly, I believe, as Cora said, that uh, never waste a good crisis. Crisis breeds opportunity. Um, but do you guys see more opportunity locally here in South Africa or offshore? Uh, uh let me say that I, I'm kind of one of those homegrown people, uh, and and because I br as I was born and bred in private equity, uh, I, I I fully appreciate the benefits of having a home ground advantage. Um, so I think that for me, it's it's easier for me to understand where the opportunities lie and where they don't in the South African economy. Uh, I will not purport to try and be able to identify it in bigger and the developed economies. Um, so me, I'll, I'll rather try and scratch locally before I go and burn money offshore. As we can see, I, I want you to show me South Africans other than Tencent who has made money 
uh, in Australia or the UK or Europe. Uh, it's because of the people underestimate this home ground advantage. You will see how companies are also struggling in the rest of the continent. Th there's, a, there's something, there's a lot to be said about home ground advantage. And, and as we have seen uh, during, after post, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, um, and, and there were a couple of other incidents that happened uh, into the economic system post that, that has made, uh, uh, that had increased, you know, they used to call it back then, they used to call it the regulation tsunami. The regulatory environment in these jurisdictions is insane. We barely know our own. And now you are going to deploy capital in a jurisdiction that has regulations that you don't understand, you don't know how long is a piece of string. So for me, I think listed, maybe the stuff that there are some interesting listed uh, um, counters uh, 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 offshore, but for the stuff that I do and the stuff that Cal does, I uh, stick local. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> So I, th I think the view for me is also micro versus macro. So if you're investing at a macro level, so the largest player in a stable industry, then you, your growth rate tends to equal your GDP growth to a large extent. And every time you have a shock, you get hammered. At the micro level, like a business like ours, we're still growing into a new sector. We've got high growth rates. We can still manage our cost structures. We've got new opportunities. Like, why would we want to go and invest in, in a new market? So you know, at a micro level, I, I wouldn't, if I was a builder and entrepreneur, run to another market when I know that there's massive opportunity and growth rate in this country. If I was investing in the stock market, it's a different discussion, because then, you, then you're affected by more by the macro forces than the micro forces. That's a great answer. Guys, we, we have run out of time um, and uh, I, t I see there's a bunch more questions that have come from online we're gonna have to defer them hopefully I can send them through to Co uh, Cora and Carl and and hopefully we can get some answers at some other stage from uh, uh, Eve Pennington, Leslie Vartikain, um, Murray Robertson I see a bunch of guys coming through uh, uh, from social but but thanks to everybody online who's joined us and uh, and thank you to everybody here who's braved the elements and uh, got amongst it. It's great to have you out in the wild. Hopefully you can join us for a glass of, of sumptuous Cape wine, Baxberg's finest over there. And we've got some Sir Fruit and Goodleaf. And, uh, and, uh, and, and please do take um, uh, one of the, good, the, the Creed Living Big Banting Loaves, which is my favorite. And please let me know what you think of it because I'm a huge fan. Um, and just lastly, a massive thanks to the team from Hala um, who've helped us out tonight, and Sabri, uh, our old faithful, as well as the team at Heavy Chef, and Jojo, Randall, Moabi, Sia, Yolandi, Lucanio, Louis, and Nicola. You guys flip and rock. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful team and, and helping this community and, uh, and uh, believing in the cause. Thank you to everyone here, and let's let's continue forth and uh, and make it rain, guys. Thank you. Thank you to Colin. Thanks, Fred. <laughs>